Software Engineering Daily is sponsored by Hired.com. If you're looking for a job, Hired.com is the place to start. I've used it personally, and it is an excellent service. Software engineers and designers can get five interviews in a week with top companies. Go to Hired.com slash Software Engineering Daily for a $4,000 bonus upon accepting a job. Thank you, Hired.com. SQLite is a relational database management system. It is arguably the most widely deployed database engine in the world. Richard Hipp is the original developer of SQLite. Richard, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you for having me. What is SQLite? SQLite is a an SQL database engine, the same as MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server. But instead of being a client server database, it's a standalone library. It, it's linked into your application, and it writes directly to the disk rather than talking to a server. So why did you create SQLite? Uh, I was uh, originally doing freelance software development, and I was working on a project, and the customer said that we had to read the data off of an Informix server, and that worked great, And but we didn't control the Informix server, and then when the, the server would be down, which it was sometimes due to a configuration problem, we would try to connect to the server, and we couldn't. And then our application would bring up a dialog box that said, we can't connect to the server. But because it was our application that was painting the dialog box, we got the support call, even though we had no control over the, the database server. So I was brainstorming, and we had the idea, if if – why can't we just read and write directly from the disk? In this particular application we were working on, uh, the database was essentially read-only. So there were no concurrency issues. And I thought, why do we even need to talk to a server? So that's why I originally wrote SQLite. Uh, I put it out on on my website along with other open source packages that I've written over the years. And I expected it to you know, get a similar level of attention, which is to say – five to ten downloads per year. <laughs> but for some reason, it, it really clicked. It seemed to solve a big problem that other people were having, and it, it grew from there. When you, when you talk about these like configuration problems, what are the configuration issues that are typically associated with databases? Well, any client-server database has configuration files. There are entire books written about how you have to set it up. You have to choose where to put it, where to store the data, uh, what ports to listen on, what the security settings are, passwords. There's a whole – there's mo- there's at least one configuration file, possibly multiple configuration files that you have to edit and, and customize for each installation. SQLite, on the other hand, has no server. It's, it's built into your application. It's just reading and writing directly from the disk. Another way to think about SQLite is that it's not trying to replace Postgres or Oracle. It's trying to replace fopen. It just opens the file and reads the content out of it. There are no setup or configuration options. So to contrast SQLite, can you describe the client-server interaction of a typical database management system? So for a typical client-server database, the application – has some statement or statements of SQL, and it calls a, a client-side library, which encodes that SQL statement, then sends it across some kind of interprocess communication, usually TCP IP, but it could be other things. And then it, that goes to the server. The server then parses the SQL, does whatever operations the SQL has requested, then sends the data back across the wire to the client, and then a client library decodes the answer and provides it to the application. With SQLite, that whole transmittal back and forth across the wire is completely omitted. Instead, the parsing of the SQL and the the analysis and the query planning all happens in process, and then the content is extracted directly from the disk. So to clarify for listeners who um, may be a little confused, does 
the client server interaction that is typical of other databases, does that mean that the database is on a totally different computer that the client is accessing? Often it does, but not necessarily. Um, mm. uh, certainly, if you are developing an application where the data is on a separate computer, you ought to be using a client server database like Postgres. I mean, SQLite could, because SQLite has to access the data files directly. Now, you could have SQLite configured to read the data files using a network file system like NFS, but that's really slow because any database engine acts as a filter. It's it's reading a lot more off the disk than actually the it's reading more data off the disk than ultimately gets to the application. So you want the data filter to be close to the data. So you want the database engine that, that way. So if, if your data is remote from your application, you want it filtered remotely so that less information has to go across the wire because the, the internet connect, or the network connection is the slow link. Right. So how does the latency differ between SQLite and one of these typical client-server databases? Well, uh, assuming the data is local, SQLite is often very much faster because it doesn't have to encode messages and send them to a different process. It just reads the information directly off the disk. And could you talk a little more about how SQLite is actually storing the data? So um, in, in most other database systems, relational database systems, the content is stored in a, a, a directory hierarchy full of files, often several levels deep. Uh, with SQLite, all of the content is stored in a single file on disk. And this is another interesting advantage of SQLite because uh, it allows you to use SQLite as an uh, it allows you to use an SQLite database as an application file. So if you're writing a desktop application, for example, instead of having file save and then um, writing a bunch of, of, of XML or JSON or something you made up into a file, instead you could write it into an SQLite database. And it's just a single file on disk, which can then be uh, sent as an email attachment to a colleague or written out to a memory stick very simply. The advantages of doing that is that um, if you're using SQLite rather than just writing stuff yourself, is that if while you're writing, if you lose power or if your system crashes, the writes are still atomic. It won't corrupt the file. You also have the advanced query language of SQL available. And uh, and also it's, it's an open format and SQL readers are available in – for all platforms, and they work from just about any language. We've seen some projects use SQL, SQLite databases as sort of their interchange file format. So different teams on the project will be programming in different languages, some in C++, some in Python, some people in, I don't know, Lisp, whatever. And they're all using the languages they're most comfortable with, but they can all – speak to the same SQLite database files, and so they can interchange their data very simply. Yeah, so you've said that SQLite wants to be an application file format. Is is that what you just described, this this uh, multi-purpose file format? It is. Uh, it, it, it does tend to get used that way a lot. Um, and that's a different way of thinking about SQL. So many people, they hear SQL and they think big centralized relational database <laughs> engine that's in the data center. And and certainly SQL is used in that context a lot, but it can also be used to store these little individual files that applications write, and it works very well at that. Right. So how does an application access a SQLite database? Well, let's let's suppose you're in... C or C++, there's just a single API call to the SQLite library that says, open this file, and you give it a file name. It's kind of like fopen, and it returns a an object, and then on that object, 
uh, you you pass that object SQL strings, just text that contain SQL statements. And for each one of these SQL statements, you get back the the query results. If it's a query, or if it's a an insert statement or a create table statement, it just does whatever you ask it to do. And then at the end, you call SQLite three close to to close the object that you got back, and you're done. So it's very similar to the whole f open, f write, f close idea of traditional I/O in C, but instead you've got this very high level language of SQL that it's interacting with instead of writing raw bits. And so SQL Lite locks the entire database while the database is being written to. When it's when the database is in this locked state, can other applications still read from it? Right. They, they can, um, depending on how you have it set up. Because of portability issues, the default setting is that for the few milliseconds that one application is writing to the database, other applications are excluded from reading it. And we do that because that's the most portable. Okay, so what happens if, if multiple threads try to access the SQLite database at once? Well, um, usually they just take turns. They queue up. They, uh, if, if two processes or threads try to access the database in a, in a way that isn't going to work, the, the second one to try is going to get back a, a, an error when they attempt, which is, hey, we're busy. And you can set a timeout and it'll keep trying for – some number of seconds or milliseconds until it, it gets through, or you can take other actions. It's up to the application how to do that. I didn't add before that we, you can put SQLite in what we call write-ahead log mode. And in write-ahead log mode, uh, one process can be writing while others are simultaneously reading. The reason we don't make that the default setting is that it requires a shared memory between each of the processes accessing the database, which means it won't work over a network file system. And we also use mem- mem- our MMAP to acquire that shared memory. And there are a few obscure operating systems that have bugs in their MMAP implementation, and that doesn't work very well. <laughs> okay. Um, so how does this this model of, of threading compare to the typical model for server client server based databases? Right. For a, a client server, they're they're typically designed to handle hundreds or thousands of simultaneous write operations. Nobody ever blocks. That's what they're designed for. They're designed okay. to handle a huge number of clients. SQLite is designed for less concurrency. It's Remember, it's the database for the edge of the network versus the database for the data center. Absolutely. So let's zoom out a little bit. The design goals of SQLite were, uh, I mean, as you described in your initial story, they were kind of about this desire to be able to operate a database without installing a database management system or needing a database administrator, a DBA, so why is this such an important requirement? Why is this so useful? Well, as long as your database server is working, it's not important. But databases break down or database servers break down. And if you're distributing millions or even billions of devices, a certain fraction of the database servers will break down. And that means applications don't work. So SQLite gets used on all smartphones from all manufacturers and to store things like contact data. And you don't want to have problems starting up MySQL on your Android phone just to to get some contacts saved. You just want to <laughs> you don't want to call a DBA to fix your exactly. phone. Exactly. And li- likewise SQLite is used uh, in Firefox to store your your bookmarks among other things. And you don't want to have to install Postgres in order to run Firefox. <laughs> and then, then go through all the 
corresponding configuration details, selecting where to store the data and 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 what ports to listen on, et cetera, et cetera. So when you created SQLite, did you have any experience writing databases or creating databases? No, that was part of the fun. I had to kind of make this up as I went along. And I did some things a little bit differently, but uh, it worked out well in the end. So I've learned a lot about SQL and SQL databases over the over the ensuing 15 years. I imagine that beginner's mind was something of an asset. I'm not so sure. It might have been <laughs> if I had taken at least one course in relational databases in college. Did you? Were there any like total blundering errors that you made that you you remember? Oh, I'm sure I could think of some. Uh, I I did some things wrong. I didn't understand the SQL language perfectly, uh, but I think we fixed most of it at this point. Okay. So, so you've called SQLite a conceptual fork of PostgreSQL, Postgres SQL, SQL, whatever you want to call it. Um, so what does this mean? What does this conceptual fork mean? Well, when I wrote SQLite, I, I looked at the SQL standards. And if you've ever tried to read those standards, they're impenetrable text, <laughs> they're completely un, 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 uncomprehensible. And so I, I basically use the Postgres documentation as my reference for how to write or how to process SQL. To be fair, that's – when I was writing that application uh, that was having trouble with Informix, for development work, we used Postgres on our local workstations because it was so much easier to set up and it didn't require a license. And then we cut over to use Informix uh, for final testing and delivery. So we were very familiar with, with Postgres at the time, and then we had all the documentation right there at hand. So if I wanted to know the details of how the syntax went in some obscure case, I could quickly consult Postgres and, and do whatever it is they did. So you can see some similarities uh, between SQLite and Postgres. We have a vacuum command, which I think is only, other, only available otherwise in Postgres, and I'm Mistaken about that? Do other databases have a vacuum? I have no idea what vacuum is. Well, it, well in in the case of um, SQLite, it just goes through and kind of reorganizes and tightens up the the database file to make it smaller and more compact. Oh. Kind of like uh, what do they call it on Windows, where you go through and right click clean up. Yeah, where you clean up the disk drive and it it uh, yeah that sort of thing. Um. But that that came directly out of out of Postgres. We we used to have a copy command in SQLite, which was copied directly out of Postgres. But that went away because it's non-standard SQL. Mm. Yeah. So I watched a talk where you described a SQL logic test suite that you ran on five different databases. So you ran this test on Postgres, SQLite. MySQL, Oracle, and uh, SQL Server. And so out of the five of them, out of the five databases, the only database that passed all the tests was Postgres. That, and the other four databases always crashed or gave incorrect answers. So are we going to say something? Well, not always crashed, but we did manage oh. to crash them all at least right. once. Right. So what, what were the operations in this test suite that only Postgres could, could pass uh, reliably? You know, there wasn't anything unusual in in the operations. It was a bunch of inserts, updates, deletes, and queries. Um, Shane Harrelson uh, designed all of those tests for us, and there's, I think, some hundred megabytes of of SQL text that we run through all the various systems. And it had to be carefully designed because all of these queries had to be built in such a way that they worked on all those five platforms, and it, as you may know, there are subtle differences between the semantics of the various database engines, especially when you talk about MySQL. It's a little bit – it's kind of the outlier. But we, we came up with a syntax that would work on all these systems, and then we just bombarded it with tons of SQL. And 
the the cases that that crashed on on the other four systems were not that unusual. They were not corner cases. It's just we happened to hit the right combination of 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 queries and inserts and updates that caused them to fail. Now so this is more of a load test. I you know it may, maybe um, mm. it was you know we we ran this test back in. I think 2007. I'd have to go back and look. It's it's a little bit old. Hopefully, those all of these bugs have been fixed on all of the systems. Certainly, they have on SQLite, but they were obscure. It's not to worry about them. I think, uh, for example, mm-hmm. with Oracle, we say it crashed. That just means that uh, you know Oracle has multiple processes going. And it's just the one process we were talking to would crash, and then it would automatically get restarted, and we would have to reopen the connection to the database server. It's kind of like our database connection kind of dropped asynchronously, and we had to bring it back up. We didn't lose data or anything like that. It just... Yeah. So at least at this point in time, what was what was it that made Postgres so resilient? You know, that was a big question I had, and I talked to the... Postgres developers and you know why is it that that Postgres is so reliable and they didn't really have an answer either it just turned out to be that way um, SQLite has a really really intense test suite uh, we, we, we test uh, we, we follow the guidelines of a spec called um, DO 178B which is was developed by the FAA and is used for safety critical software on aircraft. <laughs> and and we 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 test SQLite very very intensely like this. And Postgres they have good testing, but it doesn't come to the level of DO one seventy eight B. And I asked them, how is it that your system is so reliable? They didn't have a good answer. We talked about it some more, and. We ultimately kind of concluded that uh, Postgres works so well because they are, you know, they've, they've, it's, it's old code. It's been around a long time, and they're very reluctant to make any changes to the core. It has to be very carefully inspected, and they're very slow to change. Hmm. Whereas I can't speak for the other database engines. With SQLite, because we have this DO178B compliant test infrastructure, We'll just rip out entire subsystems and rewrite them for a point release. We 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 code fearlessly. That is such an interesting lesson in software development. The the uh, the upsides of having a rigorous test suite. Yes, it really allows us to make rapid changes and to to make invasive changes and not fear breaking something. Yeah, is, is is Postgres? I don't know the open source model. Is, is Postgres open source? It is. It is. And so is so is SQLite. SQLite is open source. the The code is we put it in the public domain, which complicates things a little bit. Uh, that means that it's open source. It's not open contribution. We don't we don't accept contributions from people on the internet. Ah, why not? Well, because then. Those people could claim copyright on their contributions, and that would mean that SQLite would no longer be public domain. There's no open source license that that, that allows for that. I mean, isn't isn't that like what Linux is? And well, now with Linux, that's GPL. Okay. So the advantage of GPL is that by looking at the code, you have accepted the license agreement. And that means that anybody can contribute to GPL freely. GPL is very friendly for contributors. And then we have the set of licenses, all very similar, like the Apache license or the BSD license, which allows anybody to do anything with the code. But for those cases, contributors have to desi- have to sign some documentation that says they are contributing their contributions under the same license that they received them. And so it has to be paperwork filed. So with the Apache-style license, there's a, a, a contributor's agreement that everybody has to sign in order to contribute to the code. That makes it a little bit harder to contribute code to the project, but it makes it easier for people who are just using the code. 
Mm. So there's a trade-off between GPL and Apache-style licenses. SQLite is really kind of on the extreme end of that because it tries to be public domain. Uh, anybody that contributes has to go through – has to sign some legal documents saying that they are dedicating their their work to the public domain. And it also means we cannot accept contributions from people who live in legal jurisdictions that do not recognize the public domain or which do not allow people to disavow their copyright. So in practice, does this differentiate from uh, Linux in a way that like people can fork Linux and then make a proprietary version of it? Well, or? No, with Linux, because it is GPL, you cannot fork it and make a proprietary version. You're oh, okay. held by the license to always – publish your, your changes. With Postgres, which is, I believe, a BSD license, and with SQLite, anybody can grab the code and create their own pri- proprietary version and, oh. and slap any license on it they want. Oh, I see. But a lot of the big companies that use SQLite, they, they really treasure this openness. And, that's, and so we actually get some companies that pay us just to keep it open source. Fascinating. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of curious about like, um, what about what about MySQL? Does does that uh, do, are you familiar with with uh, their like open source model and how that differs from Postgres and and uh, SQLite? I'm not real up on it. Is it okay. MySQL GPL? I don't know. I don't. I, I don't I have to <laughs> okay. Whatever. All right. Different. Different conversation. Um, anyway, not to get off on a uh, license tangent. Um, so let's talk more about SQL Lite. Um, so SQL is a standard, and SQL Lite does not implement all of that standard. Um, what is SQL Lite missing from the SQL standard? Standard is such a funny term. <laughs> I, I I don't know of any two SQL database engines that are completely compatible with each other. Uh, sure, there are standards, but the the SQL standard in particular is so ambiguous in places that there really are – every system has its own little quirks. Everybody tries to be mostly compatible with everybody else, but it reminds me a lot of the state of compilers in the early – or the mid-1980s where – or even before then where if you, if you took your code base from one compiler to another, your C code or Pascal code, you'd have to make changes to the code just to get it to compile. And sadly, SQL is still in that state. Um, we try and make our our language as compatible as we can with all of the others, but there are just some things that are completely incompatible, and, and we can't match it across the board. Sure. Um, most of what we're missing is is things that don't apply to a serverless database like SQLite, such as user management. When you have a client server database, you have lots of of ways of, of saying this user is allowed to access these parts of the database and this other user can only read but not write and so forth. User permissions. Got it. With SQLite, you're just reading off of a file on disk. And so any process that can read any part of that file can read or write the entirety of the file. User permissions don't matter. So we don't support that. Got it. And the other funny thing is that SQLite really began as a uh, Tickle extension. Uh, are you familiar with the, the TCL or Tickle programming language? Uh, not intimately. It was really, really popular in the 90s. It's still widely used, but it's not as popular as it once it was. But SQLite began as a Tickle extension, and Tickle is a a dynamic language like Python or, or Perl or PHP where – Variables can hold any type of data you want. So SQLite has that same feature where you can declare a column in a table to say hold integer, and but then you can go put a big string in it and 
And SQLite will say, well, he wants to store an integer, and it will try to convert that string to an integer if it looks like an integer. But if it doesn't look like an integer, it'll just store it as a string. And that can be either a, a feature or a bug, depending on the <laughs> point of view. Uh, some people find it a little bit unsettling. The only problems it ever causes seems to be when people develop their application using SQLite initially for, during development. And then they want to cut their application over to Postgres or some other system that more rigidly enforces typing for deployment. And at, only at that point do they find out that they, they messed up some typing thing somewhere and it's not working quite like they wanted to. So let's talk about some use cases for SQLite and, and how these use cases get implemented. Um, do you have a favorite application example for uh, what you've seen SQLite be used for? No, I don't have a favorite. I'm I'm okay. I'm a, I'm constantly amazed at, at at some of the creative ways people use SQLite. Maybe my favorite would be how it's used in Firefox to store all of your bookmarks. Yeah, how does that work? Well, whenever you make a bookmark in Firefox, it writes it into an SQLite database. And on Firefox, they have this thing called um, the awesome bar. When you, you start typing in that place where the URL belongs, it immediately pops up lots of suggestions based on what you've typed so far. And I, I actually use that more than I do bookmarks because I just start typing the first two or three characters of the site and it pops it up for me. Yeah. Every time you press a key in that awesome bar, there's a, a big query that runs that looks at all the sites that you visited and how much time you spent on them and, and comes up with those suggestions. It's all done with one query. It's very interesting. Uh, do you have any idea what that query looks like? Uh, I, I did go and scrape that query off several years ago, and I have put it in some presentations. I haven't looked at it in the last few years. They may have changed it for all I know. Mm. The other thing is that like when, when you're – in Firefox, when you, you're you editing your bookmarks and you know how you can drag bookmarks from one folder to another in the hierarchy? Yeah. They use what's called a common table expression to verify that you aren't creating uh, a, 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 a bookmark loop by dragging a folder full of bookmarks into a subfolder of itself. Right. It's a really cool thing. It replaced, I don't know... 50 or 100 lines of, of, of code with, with a three-line uh, common table expression in SQL. I thought it was really clever. Very cool. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. DigitalOcean offers simple cloud infrastructure for developers. In one click, you can have a mean stack, a Rails application, an Ubuntu box, or another custom environment. Software Engineering Daily is proud to have DigitalOcean as a sponsor because DigitalOcean is the simplest cloud service provider. I've interviewed Moisey Oretsky, who is a founder of DigitalOcean, and he told me that DigitalOcean was based on this realization that other cloud service providers are so complicated. If you want things to be simple when you deploy your application, use DigitalOcean. To try DigitalOcean, go to digitalocean.com and enter promo code SEDAILY. That promo code is one word, SEDAILY. Now let's get back to our show. In this talk I saw, um, you gave a couple examples of things that do not use SQLite that might benefit from SQLite. And I really liked your example of OpenOffice. So OpenOffice does not use SQLite, but in, in an alternate universe, it could have used SQLite. How would OpenOffice have been improved if it had SQLite? Let me start by saying, to be fair to OpenOffice, <laughs> they're... they're their design and their file format was created long before SQLite. So there's no way they could have used SQLite without being able to see into the future. But no, they the the documents, the open there's a name for it, the open document format or ODF. ODF. I think. Or ODT? <sighs> I don't remember. Anyway, there's a yeah. it's an open something. But all of the documents generated by OpenOffice are, in fact, zip archives. They, I know they have like ODT and ODP and 
suffixes like that, but they're really zip archives. You can do unzip and look and see what's inside them. <laughs> so, for example, an open office presentation. Should we be saying LibreOffice now? I'm, I'm, oh, I, I, I I'm not know. sure. I've, I've lost track of that. But for the presentation or for a, a slideshow for a presentation, uh, you've got this big glob of XML that defines what all the slides are. And then for resources like images and and that sort of thing, those are all separate files in this zip archive. The advantage, just in our alternate universe, if we imagine that that SQLite was used instead of a zip archive, um, if when when you open a presentation right now on you open an open office presentation. If you have several hundreds of slides, you get a little progress bar as it slowly oh, yeah. unpacks the zip archive and reads a few dozen or a few hundred megabytes of content into RAM yeah. and, and instantiates objects in, internally. But if it were SQLite, it could just query for the first slide and pop it up immediately. Yeah. Similarly, if I've got it big presentation up with 100 slides and I fix a single typo, one character change, and then press save, with the current format, it has to completely replace the entire zip archive, rewriting out all those images and everything else. So I, I made a one character change and I've burned through 20 or 30 megabytes of my finite SSD disk. You know, it's funny because I always wondered why... I was always so frustrated to use OpenOffice or LibreOffice, and I think you have finally explained it to me. So, you know, with SQLite, you would only have to make the, the you know, the one character change. Well, probably you'd change one page of the database file, which we can assume is 1K. But that happens so quickly that you could, in fact, rig it so that it updates the presentation as you type. It could do an update with every keystroke. Yeah. And that means that if the application crashed, which OpenOffice tends to do, <sighs> if the application crashes, you haven't lost any work. It's all still there. Yeah. Yeah, so I love that example. And another another really good example you give is Git. You've suggested that Git would be better if it were driven by an SQLite database. How would that look? Well, you know, there are a lot of problems with Git. And... Um, it, I know that it's absolutely the most popular uh, version control system out there today, but there are some things about it that just, just don't work for me. For example, if, if you look at an historical check-in and get an historical version, and you want to say, what comes next? Go to GitHub, go backwards in time a little bit on some project, and look at a particular check-in and say, what did people check in against this? What changed after this? Mm. There's no way to do that. And the, it, it, to, to, to find out how that is, you have to go back and look at the Git log, which is just text. If they had just made that Git log an, a, a relational database of some sort, you could query against it and immediately find what came next. You know, they could even backfit Git to do this instead of having the Git log or in addition to the Git log, if they just put an SQL database there beside it to record all of the check-ins, you could do all sorts of amazing queries at that point and find all, all kinds of interesting historical data. One thing that I often do on my projects is I have multiple um, related projects and I'll see a change in one project which is closely related to another one but is in a separate repository. And I'll see this change, and it'll be from one or two or three years ago. And I'll think, well, what was going on over here in our test code while we were changing the main project? And then I can go over in the other repository and say, show me all of the check-ins within 10 days of this particular date. And I can see what we were doing two or three years ago in one yeah. screen. And that's a very, very helpful thing. Because of the way Git is structured – Doing that is very difficult to do, but if if just the Git log were in a relational database, it would be a simple query. Have you discussed that with anybody that works on Git? 
Um, I haven't been able to connect with people on Git. I've given some talks about it, and I've said, you know, if you know any of the core Git committers, um, uh, you should get us in touch so that I could go out and and give them a presentation of suggestions and all yeah. free code. But so far, I haven't been able to make that connection. Hmm. It's too bad. Um, yeah, that sounds interesting. I don't know. Um, I wonder if it's a kind of an insular community, but I, I shouldn't speak about it. I don't know. I, about I, don't know. Um, I don't know how much Linus is still involved with Git development. Um, yeah. My, my understanding is that he doesn't really uh, – do relational databases, and I, I base this on on two pieces of evidence. One is that in in Git he called the staging area an index, and I can't imagine somebody who had prior exposure to SQL using that context. <laughs> and the other thing is, it's I was doing an interview like this one um, several years ago, I, and for a different podcast and. And and they had Linus on the following week. And when I was listening to that follow-on podcast, and they asked some questions, said, "Well, last week Richard Hip said so and so and so forth." Uh, uh, and Linus answered the question very gracefully. He was, you know, you know, he was very graceful, very kind. But it was abundantly cl- clear that he had no idea who I was. Right. So I just assumed that he doesn't really follow the database world very closely. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so. A couple more usages. Two of the most popular web frameworks, Django and Ruby on Rails, have the default database as SQLite. Why did they choose SQLite? I think they probably did that because it allows people to get up and running quickly with a minimum of fuss. You don't have to install Postgres or MySQL in order to try out Django or Ruby on Rails. But if I'm not mistaken, they encourage people to switch to MySQL or Postgres prior to deployment. Why is that? Those systems are designed to scale. They're designed right. to handle multiple transactions simultaneously from multiple riders. In truth, for 99% of websites, SQLite is going to work fine. You really only need to go to those other systems – when your traffic gets to the point that you need to start having multiple machines. So to clarify, what is the bottleneck that applications that are trying to scale will hit when they're using SQLite? Uh, SQLite only allows a single writer at a time. Yeah. Now, you know, that write takes a few milliseconds. It's not like it's locking up the database forever, but still... And if you've got multiple front-end machines all handling your web traffic, you, you're going to want to be having multiple people writing to the database simultaneously. And SQLite is just really not designed for that. Yeah. This is a case where you, you, you've got a database in the data center, and so you should use a database that's designed for that, whereas SQLite is designed for – appliances on the edge of the network, not in the data center. So to clarify for people who still, I know we've discussed this a bit, but to clarify for people who may not really understand the difficulties of concurrent writes, what are the requirements you need for a system that can do concurrent writes? Why is it so difficult? Well, that's kind of a long story. The, for one thing, to get all this concurrency, you're normally depending on special features of the hardware and operating system. So it it might be – it would be easier to write a highly concurrent database that, that existed on just Linux or just Windows than it would be to write a highly concurrent database that did Linux, Windows, Mac, QNX – various BSDs and other operating systems that are scarcely used. The other thing is that with highly concurrent systems, you you typically have multiple files of data. Remember, one of the key features of SQLite is that the entire database is in a single file on disk. Yeah. 
that's having everything in one file is really convenient for an application. But when you're going for maximum concurrency, you really want lots of files in a directory hierarchy. Yeah. Also, after a power loss or a system failure, there's typically a recovery procedure, which is much more involved uh, for a client-server database because it has to recover lots of things happening simultaneously. Uh, right. You typically need a multi-threaded server to handle concurrency well. SQLite can work in a multi-threaded process, and, and, and you can have multiple threads using SQLite simultaneously, but SQLite itself does not use multiple threads. It's not doing trying to do things simultaneously. You call it, it does some work, it returns, and it's done. <laughs> and th that's very useful for an application, but when you're trying to go highly concurrent, that can get in the way. And finally, the... I think the concurrency requires a lot more code. And we want to keep SQLite small and compact so that you can just drop it into an application and it doesn't cause things to bloat. Uh, years ago, uh, with less powerful smartphones, the smartphone makers were really pushing us to, to keep the size down. They were fussing over every single byte. These days, memory is more abundant and, and things are not quite as quite as constrained, but even then, we want to keep keep the size growth under control. So you've spent so much time thinking about databases. And one interesting thing I heard you say is that data often outlives code. What do you mean by this? Well, sure. The oh, What's a good example of that? The, you know, the application that writes the data – Applications come and go, but the data itself often lasts far beyond the application. We've got – there are lots of GIFs and JPEGs out on the internet that were generated by applications that have long since ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. But we still want to look at those GIFs and JPEGs. Uh, there was an issue um, – that came up with, with NASA and the moon landings where they had some data that they had recorded from the instruments that were left up on the moon, but they it was on mag tape and they could recover the, the binary data, but they had no idea what it meant because they had <laughs> lost the program that had generated the data and there was and, and, and the and the data was not uh, self describing. This is what Vince Cerf worries about, the digital dark age. Yes. It, well, that's taking it even further and noting that, that all of this stuff that we're producing now is so very ephemeral. Um, I, I mean, a few years ago, a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, I, he was looking for a new job and, and he had some resumes, but they were on a – three and a half inch floppy disk and he, he had no way of getting to his resume. Uh, oh, Did I no. have a machine with a three and a half inch floppy? No, I don't. <sighs> so everything is very ephemeral I and mean, we're still digging up manuscripts out of the sands of Egypt that are 3,000 years old and, and we can still read those. But who thinks we're going to be able to read a CD-ROM in 20 years? Yeah. How's that going to happen? So things are very ephemeral. That's a completely different subject. I mean, because, because, and and this this is what keeps um, people working for the National Archives uh, awake at night. How do we preserve all of this content that we're producing today? Data living longer than code is is related to that, but I it has the idea of shorter term. If you write an SQLite database today using some application you cobbled together with Python the data you store there will be readable 30 years from now using some other application written in a language that hasn't yet been invented. Yeah. That's the key thing. So in, in, in the same talk, I think you quoted Rob Pike and you, you gave this really good quote. Rob Pike said, data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organized things well, the algorithms will almost always be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. So, is this is this a continuation of our of our previous previous point, or, or does this quote mean something else to you? 
I think I use that in support of SQL relational databases versus key value stores. Mm. It's typically what you see in the, the, the no SQL world. I don't like the word the term no SQL for these key value store databases. I like to call them postmodern databases. <laughs> Because as with postmodernism, uh, there's an absence of objective truth. When you query some of the newer postmodern databases, you don't get back a fact. You get back an opinion. And I recognize that in certain applications, you need the performance and the application is willing to deal with the ambiguity that comes with it. And that's fine. But I also see a lot of people thinking that Everything should be key value, and I think that's a mistake. I think that's a premature optimization. They're going with they're, they're going with these NoSQL databases because they hear that they're really fast, but do they really need all of that performance for everything that they're doing? I mean, Google is even drifting back toward um, uh, SQL. They have their 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 global scale SQL database engine called Spanner, which. Nobody outside of Google really knows anything about, but it apparently involves some kind of custom hardware with atomic clocks that somehow circumvent the cap theorem. We're all really what? we're all really eager to find out how this works, but they haven't told us yet. You have to work for Google to find this out, apparently. Wow! But but they they are doing a lot of SQL now because they discovered that once the applications get so complex. Key value is just really, really hard to work with. You need the richness of the SQL language to to simplify things and make the problems more manageable. Well, to the um, to maybe the contrary, and this this will be a um, good segue towards concluding. Uh, there's more recently an, an interface for document oriented databases that was added to SQL Lite, and this is called. UnQL Lite. Um, what what is UnQL Lite? What was your motivation for adding uh, document oriented capability to SQL Lite? All right, I'm a little bit confused by your question. Um, oh, okay. yeah. There, there's somebody. Maybe I'm the one who's confused. There was somebody else, I think, that, that put an an, an uh, 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 a no SQL interface on top of SQL. Oh. Now, Damien Katz and I collaborated several years ago. Damien Katz wrote. CouchDB, which I don't know if you remember, at one time it was the preeminent NoSQL database. Sure. Yeah, I, I know. And and it turns out that Damien wrote CouchDB about a mile from 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 where I work here in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the same zip code. Charlotte, North Carolina. Whoever thought Charlotte, North Carolina, two eight two six nine would be a hot bre- a, a hotbed of database innovation. Silicon Carolina. Yeah, there you go. But Damien, he moved out out to the Bay Area to pursue his fortune there. But we collaborated and we tried to come up with a query language that was SQL like, but would work with these uh, no SQL databases. And we did some research along those lines. It generated a little bit of buzz. But, you know, this is our fault. We just didn't follow up with it enough, and, and we kind of let that fall by the wayside. I think everybody that sees SQL thinks it's ugly and dirty, and they want to try and rewrite it to be better. There's a bazillion attempts to do this. I've tried it several times myself, but somehow everybody always comes back to SQL. I know that the SQL language is is, is ugly and, and unglamorous, but it somehow – it, it, there's, it's in a sweet spot that, that really seems to work and has worked for decades. So, so, to, so to be clear, you have nothing to do with UnQL Lite? No. That's, I think that's a third <laughs> party. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wikipedia is somewhat misleading. Um, uh, or, may, or maybe I am just a misreader. Uh, well, anyway, um, Richard Hip, thanks so much for coming out to Software Engineering Daily. I mean, was there anything else you wanted to talk about or um, – Oh, any 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 later? Uh, what are you working on now? I guess we're always working to make SQLite go faster and have new features uh-huh. and that sort of thing. But but no, there's no earth shattering developments on the horizon. Okay. We have not we have not uh, disproved the cap theorem. We've not suddenly made it a hundred times faster. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll wait for the spanner paper and then we will see the SQLite cap theorem defining or defying. Um, 
There you go. Atomic clocks in your implementation. <laughs> yes. I don't know what an atomic clock is. I know what a vector clock is. What is it? Do you do you know what an atomic clock yeah, is? Yeah, it's a, a very precise time measurement. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay, this is the source of truth of of time. Exactly. Fascinating. Somehow they've worked out atomic clocks to to get around the cap theorem. I don't I don't really understand it. There were some hints in one paper about it. <laughs> It's Google, guys. It's the Google. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Richard. It was great talking to you. Thanks, Jeff.